Some people called me foolish woman. I think it took a smart woman to live with a man and to live in that situation. The sad passing of the legendary Tina Turner shines a new spotlight on her illustrious career and undeniable star quality. I had sicknesses and uh, I moved from America to Switzerland and retirement set in and it, things changed. Tina Turner is irreplaceable. There will never be someone else that has seen all of those different shifts in culture and history that she did and lived through it, rode the waves, and really, really was able to ride above it and reinvent herself as a true survivor. Queen of survival, the queen of reinvention, and she's a legendary singer and performer. I love Tina Turner. I mean, she was such an icon and a survivor and, and her voice, like just as a vocalist, like just listening to what she did with her voice, there's no way to describe it. With over 100 million records sold, Tina is one of the best-selling recording artists of all time. She has overcome incredible hardship with an infectious love for life and a perspective on existence that transcends her music. People still see me as Tina. I will always be Tina to them because that they only see me on stage. She went through horrible physical and emotional abuse. She went through all of the racial inequality that was happening in the South when she grew up. She went through the star system, which rejected her initially after she was by herself without Ike. All the health issues. And through the whole thing, she remained just positive and sexy and fantastic and just showing what a woman could be. Our queen, Tina, our icon, she means everything. She'll be so greatly missed. Those high heels will never be properly filled by anyone else. The legacy of Tina Turner is that of a trailblazer, an icon, and a rock and roll legend. She will forever remain simply the best. Tina Turner was born Anna Mae Bullock on November 26, 1939. Had a difficult and turbulent childhood. She was raised in Nutbush, Tennessee, a small rural town with a population of just a few hundred people. Her parents, Floyd and Zelma Bullock, were sharecroppers who struggled to make ends meet. Tina's parents' relationship was tumultuous and her father was physically abusive toward her mother. The family lived in a small house without running water, and Tina's early years were marked by poverty, hardship, and insecurity. When Tina was just 11 years old, her parents separated, and her mother moved to St. Louis, Missouri to start a new life with Tina's older sister, Aileen. Tina and her younger sister, Evelyn, were left behind in Nutbush to be raised by their grandmother. Tina's grandmother was a strict Baptist who disapproved of secular music that Tina loved, and she forbade her from listening to it. Her father was physically abusive to her mother, and this caused the mom just feeling like she had no way out. She actually abandoned the whole family and ran away when Tina was just 11 years old. And this, of course, just created absolute chaos for poor Tina. Tina and her sisters followed a while after to live with their mother in between. They lived with strict grandparents and then back with her mum and dad before her mum left. She was sent to live with her grandparents in St. Louis at that point. And that's, I think, when she first started getting into music and where she first encountered Ike Turner. Despite the challenges she faced, Tina found solace in singing, and she often performed in the church choir. As a teenager, 
Tina moved to St. Louis to join her mother and sister after her grandmother's death. It was in St. Louis that Tina's life would change forever. Tina first saw Ike Turner at the Manhattan Club when he was touring with his band King of Rhythms. And it wasn't until 1967 though, she, she, was, she was titillated, she was interested, she wanted to perform, but Ike was firmly against women performing with them. He'd had a couple other singers that were female, did not work out. But in 1967, Tina was able to get on stage and grab the mic and that gave her her in with Ike. He saw a possibility there and he agreed to let Tina perform with him. Now before that, she had sung, you know, in church, that kind of thing, but never really sung on the stage. When Tina first started performing at the age of 17, occasionally with Ike and the Kings of Rhythm, her name was actually Anna Mae Bullock. Ike made her change her name to something else, and he went with the name Tina because it reminded him of Sheena, like Sheena of the Jungle. And he thought, you know, the thing is, he'd already had some different female singers come in and out of the band, and his idea was if Tina left, he could then trademark the name because he had the Turner at the end, which was him. He was Ike Turner. So by Tina Turner, it would be a part of the whole Ike brand. So you could just replace Tina with somebody else. And that was at that stage that Anna became known as Tina to the world. Upon hearing her sing, Turner asked her if she knew more songs. She sang the rest of the night and became a featured vocalist with his band. During this period, Ike became her mentor and taught her more about vocal performance. So in 1960, Ike Turner had written A Fall in Love and he'd actually written it for another female band member, but that band member didn't turn up to sing the song. So he gave it to Anna Mae Bullock at the time to sing and she sung the song and she absolutely killed it. So he was convinced to make her, you know, the front woman of the band. That is how Tina's career took off. As she teamed up with the legendary Ike, they created some of the most electrifying music of the era. With her powerhouse voice, stunning looks, and magnetic stage presence, Tina captivated audiences around the world and quickly became a star in her own right. The first recorded song was A Fool in Love that was their first really big breakthrough. That was followed with River Deep, Mountain High, which is a song you can still turn on the classic radio and you will hear that song. That and Proud Mary, you will hear it, that's it. There's like classic songs that really put Ike and Tina Turner as a duo on the map and firmly in that same canon as classic artists from that time period. And that was really the song that introduced Tina Turner to the world, but also really introduced, even though the Kings of Rhythm, um, I Expand, had been doing their thing in nightclubs and in and around St. Louis, that's really what propelled them to go national as well. So Fall In Love was really the breakthrough song for Tina Turner, for Ike Turner, and for the band at that point as well. As Ike and Tina Turner's fame grew, they embarked on international tours and performed to sold out crowds in some of the most prestigious venues around the world. Their hit songs like River Deep, Mountain High, Proud Mary, and Nutbush City Limits became instant classics and cemented their place in music history. They also became known for their dynamic live performances. With Tina's powerful vocals, and Ike's guitar and piano skills driving the music. Tina and the review's backup singers, the Ikeettes, choreographed intricate and electrifying dance routines into their performances and influenced many other artists, including Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones, for whose 1966 UK tour they opened. Touring with the Rolling Stones allowed Ike and Tina Turner um, and their band to 
go global almost you know introduce them to a new audience it allowed them to make songs on the road as well they had many more hits in the r&b chart but also they did loads of television performances like on tnt and things like that and that introduced them to a new audience every city they were in as well so as well as being on tour and being introduced to all these new audiences they were able to make songs and they were able to hit television as well and more people got to see tina turner and she herself kind of came through as this star and started to have fame in her own right away from Ike Turner and the Kings of Rhythm away from Ike, Ike and Tina Turner review Tina Turner started to establish herself Kings of Rhythm morphed into the Ike and Tina review because Ike saw the natural talent that Tina had and they ended up opening up for the Rolling Stones. And this is, of course, we're in the late 60s, early 70s. And some of their hits started getting a lot of acclaim because of the, you know, they literally had a stage now with the Rolling Stones, a platform for people to hear and see them. <laughs> Their high-energy cover version of Creedence Clearwater's revival's 1968 Proud Mary remains Turner's signature hit and one of her longest enduring standards. Proud Mary was the duo's greatest commercial success, peaking at number four on the Billboard Hot 100 in March 1971. The single eventually won a Grammy for Best R&B Vocal Performance by a Duo or Group. Proud Mary is a song that is definitely the best known by Ike and Tina. You hear it still now all the time, more up and coming bands now and modern artists are covering it. The reason it's such an incredible banger is because starts off slow. She even says, we like to do it nice and slow. So you think it's gonna be this kind of rhythm and blues, just jazzy number. And then as Tina sings, gets, faster and faster and faster till finally at its crescendo it has almost a frantic frenetic proud mary keep on burning and this you can just almost i mean i've seen her perform it so many times but you can that energy is in the music itself even if you've never seen her of just movement and speed it's absolutely incredible and that's what makes it such a, a classic so as the 1970s rumbled on even though i and tina had had initial success and some big breakout songs People started seeing them as a little bit old fashioned and not really with it. You know, disco was was up and coming. Their songs weren't changing with the times and they had questionable management issues with touring. Cap all that off with the fact that I had a voracious cocaine habit. It just all added up to real, really career suicide in a lot of ways and things were not even though they'd been on this fantastic trajectory suddenly things were not going that well and the wheels literally started to come off the the band and the show however the duo's relationship was tumultuous and ike was often physically and emotionally abusive towards tina at first ike and tina's relationship was great you know uh, they were young they fell in love they got married uh, but as Ike's drug use continued he became increasingly violent towards Tina. Behind the glamorous stage show and the supposed happy relationship of Ike and Tina was a very abusive and horrendous real life situation for Tina. Ike was incredibly emotionally and physically abusive, and Tina really saw no way out of this. So for a majority of her marriage, she just was quiet about it. These were the days where you never talked about these sorts of these sorts of things happening in your home life. In 1968, Tina felt like she had no way out, literally no way out, no escape. And her doctor had prescribed her sleeping pills because she was having a lot of issues falling asleep. And just one night, she just thought, you know what, I'm never gonna, I'm living in hell right now with Ike in this situation. And she ended up taking the entire bottle of sleeping pills in a desperate attempt to end her life and therefore end the suffering that she was feeling. 
Some people called me a foolish woman. I think it took a smart woman to live with a man and to live in that situation. That's the credit I give myself. And so when it looked like I possibly couldn't get out because I was really afraid, I planned, okay, then, then I'll just die because I'm, I'm really tired of everything. You know, no hit records being blamed for, for, for I not being able to come up with hit records because I wasn't singing properly. And then the one night when it really just got a bit too much where crying didn't even help, I took them all almost like in two swallows and I didn't regret any of it. And actually when I, when I opened my eyes, I went, excuse expression, oh, I'm still here. <laughs> I really had planned to leave here. And then I said, after I started feeling a bit better, I said, well, it's not time yet then. So uh, that was that experience. It wasn't until July in 1976 when she was in Dallas, ICAD again had an explosive rage, hit her, beat her badly, and she somehow managed to literally run out the door of the house that they were in, run out the door, like nothing. She had no money, no bag, no nothing. She always like ran out the door. She saw her opportunity to leave and went to the Hilton where she famously said, you know, I'm Tina Turner, please let me check in, I'll, I'll do anything, I'll pay you back later. And the fact that she just left with literally the only the clothes on her back showed how desperate the situation was. This scene is recreated in the incredibly dramatic and emotionally moving biopic on Tina's life called What's Love Got to Do With It? And the actress Angela Bassett plays Tina and if nothing else in that movie stays with you, it's that scene of this woman that's been pushed to the edge of thinking nothing else matters. It is literally fight or flight. And she had gotten to the end of being able to put up with the fight. So she just had to had to leave the situation. And it's, it's absolutely heart-wrenching, heart-wrenching. Angela Bassett does Tina Proud in that scene. I'm Tina Turner. My husband and I just had a fight. I'm supposed to open at the academy tonight. I have 36 cents on a mobile car. But if you would give me a room, I swear I will pay you back. No, 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 Please. that won't be necessary. Now, Miss Turner, I'd, I'd be honored, really. Every now and then, it was some fun. Sometimes it was, but I don't remember what it was, but I remember there were days that was lighter and nicer, but mostly he was just a really, re always angry with me. Oh, he treated me like I was a prisoner and he was the guard. After their separation, United Artists released two more studio albums credited to the duo, Delilah's Power, 1977, and Airwaves 1978. Despite the controversy surrounding their relationship, Ike and Tina Turner's impact on the music and popular culture is undeniable. Their unique blend of rock, soul, and R&B helped to shape the sound of modern music. I didn't know that the way out was through the door, but that didn't come at the time. I just thought, totally helpless. And when I was really, really, really fed up, that's when I just took a chance and said, come what may, and left. I was just really tired of my life and the situation I was in with Ike. When Ike died in 2007, Tina said she had no comment. Everything had already been said. And I love that. It's 1979, Tina's finally broken up with Ike. She decides, I'm gonna try it on my own. So she puts out a disco-esque record. That was, and unfortunately, the timing was horrific. Disco was on the way out. New wave, pop music of that kind was on the way in. The record was an absolute flop. Tina was seen as a has-been. 
Then the most miraculous thing happened. She decided to give it another go. And in 1983, she did a cover of Let's Stay Together. Brilliant, brilliant. It was the lead single off the album Private Dancer, which the cover itself is iconic. Here you have Tina, who's been through all of this stuff, all these horrible things, seen as someone that should be cast on to the, out to the glue factory as being old and of no use anymore. She's on the cover of this record with a tight fitting black like leotard. She has this fantastic set of legs in fishnet tights, these huge black heels, and she's just staring down the camera with this fierce red lip like, I challenge you not to listen to this record and enjoy it. And it is banger after banger after banger. You know, first with a Let's Stay Together, then she has What's Love Got to Do With It? Ugh, Private Dancer, which if you see that video, it is just, again, complete dagger, heartbreaker. It's the total rebirth of Tina. Tina as an independent woman standing on her own two feet. Everything's tinged with a melancholic sadness though, but that kind of becomes part of the Tina brand. And that I think is one of the reasons she's such an important important diva and important icon in general. So in the late 1970s, after she'd left Ike and left the band, um, Tina was kind of considered a nostalgia act. She was performing in hotel ballrooms, doing cover versions, things like that. Um, and Roger Davies, a record exec, uh, agreed to manage her in 1979. Uh, in 1981, she was invited by Rod Stewart to perform hot leg she did a five week tour in south africa she was signed to capitol records off the back of that it was a massive hit and capitol records were surprised at how much of a hit it was so then she was given two weeks to record the album private dancer which she did she just recorded the album in two weeks and it was such a massive success and that was completely what turned it around for tina turner you know private dancer was very much the soft rock of the 80s. Um, it was quite an unlikely sort of genre for Tina Turner to make her way down, but she absolutely nailed it. I think that's why the record company was so surprised by, by the success of it, but it ended up going, you know, God knows how many times platinum, but that was really what propelled her uh, to superstardom. Private Dancer contained several hit songs, including the title track, What's Love Got To Do With It? and Better Be Good To Me, all of which showcase Tina's dynamic vocals, electrifying stage presence, and fierce independence. When Tina was with Ike in the review, she was singing more R&B. It was almost strictly R&B. River Deep and Mountain High with Phil Spector in the 60s was slightly different. It was more pop, more orchestral, but Tina always said that she loved rock music. She'd always loved that genre. and. Let's, the version of Let's Stay Together that she recorded kind of ventured into that, whereas Private Dancer really, really took that on. It was classic soft rock. And I think people were surprised because she was a black woman singing rock music. It didn't make sense at the time. Nobody else was doing it. Rock and soft rock was a predominantly white genre. And here was this black woman who was famous for singing R&B music, was suddenly singing all these really iconic rock tracks. It shouldn't have worked, but it really, really did. So after Private Dancer, you had What's Love Got To Do With It. You know, all these iconic songs, um, I mean, they're iconic now, they were just hits back then. And if there's one thing about Tina Turner is that she could span any age range. So everybody loved her music. White people loved her, black people loved her, which meant that she was selling out concerts all over the world, so from France, Germany, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, to Brazil, to you know cities across America. I think at one point in Brazil, she had the highest um, selling or, or the most amount of tickets sold for a concert, around 80,000 or something. And if you see the footage of it, it's just incredible. All these people, just like a sea of people, uh, turned out to see her. So she was doing these record-breaking tours. And I think, again, no one expected it because you have a black woman singing rock music. 
doesn't really make sense. But the point or, or, or the beauty of it was is that she hooked up with the right producers. She knew where to make the music. You know, she recorded a lot of her music in London using thin synthesizers, using different sounds that she wasn't necessarily used to with this iconic voice and just making hits on hits on hits. Tina's comeback was to the extreme. It wasn't just record sales. It wasn't just this new vision of Tina as this sexy, sensual, surviving woman. It was also her stage performance that was absolutely, literally setting the globe on fire. In fact, in 1988, she set a record in Rio de Janeiro for having the most concert attendees of all time ever at a concert up to that point. The record had actually been held by the band Queen before Tina, so Tina was a worthy person for them to pass that mantle on to, but again, Queen, amazing. Who are you here to see today? That's right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to honor Tina Turner today with star number 1,831 in Hollywood's famous Walk of Fame. Today, we honor Tina Turner for her many, many outstanding achievements in recording. In 1991, Tina was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and it's a massive honor, especially in the United States, to have this. However, Tina didn't show up. She just, at that point in her career, because it was Ike and Tina Turner, and it just was not something that she was interested in being involved in, which I love that again. It's like that, Ike and Tina was behind her. Tina Turner, the solo person, entity, artist, survivor, human, was what she was now. In 1995, Tina was presented with the song Golden Eye. Now, this was going to be the theme song for the newest Pierce Brosnan Bond movie. Every musician wants to have a Bond theme. I mean, it's instantly a signature song. It's iconic. It's, again, one of those big bucket list check marks. And this particular song was written by Bono and U2 from The Edge. And she worked with them to rewrite it to a point where it just... She brings like a Tina-ness to it that I think no one else could, and it completely defines that film. I don't think he really meant for me to sing it. I don't think he really meant that anything could come from that. I don't even really think he cared to write a song for Bond with what he gave me. I wish I still had some of that stuff, but yeah, I, I, was, I knew then that I had talent to sing anything put before me. One of my favorite Tina moments is when she stars in Thunderdome in the Mad Max series, and she plays this queen of like these outcasts. And it just is kind of like, I mean, Tina's not an outcast. She's amazing and fantastic. But the fact that at that point in her career, she would be brave enough to take on. Tina Turner the Musical has been instrumental in bringing the music of Tina Turner to a new audience. Um, when it when it came to the West End, you know, it sold out night after night after night. It br also brings Tina Turner's story to life on stage and is a vehicle for some incredible, incredible young black actresses to sing all this incredible music that Tina doesn't perform anymore. She hasn't toured for such a long time. She suffers with kidney disease and she, she doesn't keep very well, so hasn't toured for ages. It's with how record sales are not as important in the mix of making someone legendary as they were once. I think the fact that Tina Turner got her own musical was a way to bring Tina's story and this fantastic canon of music and the whole idea of who and what she is to a new generation of people. And I think that was very, very important. 
it's so crucial that people know the history of what came before. And especially someone like Tina that has just seen so much change and literally reinvented herself so many times. It's important for those stories to be known. As I came in this evening, there was a wonderful applause for me. And I thank you for that. This musical is my life, but it's like poison that turned to medicine. Thank God for her. I can never be as happy as I am now. Thank you all. There's a, mu a musical that's a hit. I think the documentary will be a hit. So aside of being really tired of talking about myself, I'm really proud of what my future as a star became. I feel proud that I hold that in my hand. In 2013, three weeks after her wedding to Erwin Bach, Tina had a stroke. She had to learn how to walk again. After all the tumultuous and horror with Ike, you'd think that Tina would probably never give love another shot. In 1985, Tina meets Erwin back, and he was actually uh, a representative from the record label who was just m sent to meet her um, at the airport one day. He was 16 years her junior, so initially uh, they were just friends, but they eventually got together and they got married in Switzerland in 2013. Why I felt so comfortable leaving America was because everyone treated me not as a black person. They treated me just as a, as a star. <sighs> Difference. It's different than when I was there. My attitude about being there is I had lived there the first 50 years of my life, and now I'm moving to another country. Um, part of that was because of my relationship with Irvin. Part of that was I was always treated a little bit different in those other countries than in America, because in America, a black singer, R&B singer, is always a black singer, R&B singer. I'm happier than I ever thought that life would become for me. So that means that most of my hardships came while I was young and growing up. And in the last days, when normally people suffer from old age and sickness, my happiness came. I am, I'm really thoroughly happy. In her 2018 book, My Love Story, Tina revealed that she had suffered life-threatening health issues in recent years, and she was seen less, spending time away from the spotlight and the public eye. In 2016, she was diagnosed with intestinal cancer. She turned to homeopathic remedies to treat her high blood pressure but these eventually led to kidney failure. Tina, however, has been beset with all kinds of health issues. In fact, in 2013, she had a stroke and has to learn how to walk all over again. And just when that seemed to be behind her, in 2016, she had to battle intestinal cancer. And Tina decided that she was not going to do traditional medicine. She was instead going to go the homeopathic route. And from doing this, it caused a lot of strain on her kidneys. And she was told that she was going to either need to be on dialysis the rest of her life and that eventually she would need a kidney transplant of some kind. So things looked quite grim. It's 20, 20 years later, I think, probably a little bit more. And a lot has happened since the stage life and my life changed. I had sicknesses and uh, I moved from America to Switzerland and retirement set in and it, things changed. You know, actually I had retired. I haven't actually tried to sing since, but I'm sure I can. Oh, yes. It's a mild stroke from the back of the head. Mm -hmm. And then they took me down in the room, and I didn't believe it. I saw a stroke mm -hmm. like that. They left the room. 
flop hit the floor. After we found, got rid of the stroke, then the swindle started, this dizziness. Uh. So they found out what that was in the inner ear. We corrected that. And then after that was the kidney thing. They, they found that, no, that was this one next, the, the colon. The Swiss people are like the English, they have manners. Mm -hmm. he says. So I said, well, so what happens? He said, if you don't maintain, if you don't do what we recommend, you will probably die. Only one of your kidneys are functioning. Actually, what happened was I stopped medication for kidney because I was tired of the medicine and I wanted to see what I felt like, my old self, because it has the blood pressure medicine holds, holds it, it restricts you a little bit. And th they say to, they say to Urban, you can live with one kidney. So Urban thought, no, Urban said to the doctors, can I give her one of mine? Something similar to this, I wasn't there. And then he found out that he doesn't need two kidneys. So then he came to me and said, Tina, you don't have to make this decision now. I, I can give you one of my kidneys. And I said, oh, Urban, you're young. I'm already older. It's okay, you just get used to me not being here. And I did feel like I, I was older. I was already in my 70s. So why should I take the kidneys from a young man and let him finish his life? That, that's what I felt like. And he said, no, 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 my life is fine how it is. I'll give you one of my kidneys. Tina Turner's recent years have been nothing short of glamorous. After retiring from performing in 2009, she has been living a life of luxury and relaxation, surrounded by her loved ones and enjoying the fruits of her decades-long career. She spent her time between her extravagant homes in Switzerland and France, which are filled with beautiful artwork, exquisite furniture, and other treasures she has collected throughout her illustrious career. She has been a longtime supporter of several organizations, including the Children's Hospital in Zurich and the Beyond Foundation, which supports music education for young people. On Thursday, May 25th, 2023, Tina Turner died peacefully at her home in Switzerland after a long illness. Her spokesperson said, with her, the world loses a music legend and a role model. Following the announcement, there was an incredible outpouring of grief and tributes across social media from some of the biggest stars. Tina previously had intestinal cancer and suffered a stroke, revealing in 2018 that her husband had donated a kidney to save her life as she contemplated assisted suicide. Tina Turner is irreplaceable. There will never be someone else that has seen all of those different shifts in culture and history that she did and lived through it, rode the waves, and really, really was able to ride above it and reinvent herself as a true survivor. We throw that word around a lot now, but if we think about Tina, she went through horrible physical and emotional abuse. She went through all of the racial inequality that was happening in the South when she grew up. She went through stars, the star system, which rejected her initially after she was by herself without Ike. All the health issues, and through the whole thing, she remained just positive and sexy and fantastic and just showing what a woman could be. And she'll be so greatly missed. Those high heels will never be properly filled by anyone else. The queen of survival, the queen of reinvention, and she's a legendary singer and performer. Despite retiring from performing in 2009, her timeless music, stunning performances, and unapologetic attitude will always be a testament to her enduring impact on the world of entertainment. Her rise to fame was a true Cinderella story filled with glamour, passion, and perseverance. But perhaps most importantly, Tina's legacy as a feminist icon and advocate for human rights has made her a true inspiration. Her unwavering commitment to philanthropy and support for causes like children's education and AIDS research 
are a testament to her enduring impact and her commitment. There is no doubt that Tina Turner's legacy as a trailblazing performer and all-around glamour goddess continues to inspire new generations of artists and fans.